We have some more news. We have a lovely new arrival on the farm, a beautiful little heifer who we've named Beatrix. Beatrix, Beatrix came to us um, just a couple of weeks ago. She was absolutely no trouble in fact. Look, uh, <laughs> our cow, um, we sort of saw, saw that she was getting bigger and bigger and we, well Pascal called it. She said, yep, that cow is ready to drop. Um, and we were expecting a sleepless night, but no, it, it was just uh, it's a very, very straightforward. And we just woke up the next morning to a beautiful little calf. Yep, there she was and Astrid was just licking her and it was like nothing had happened. She really was, um, was yeah, she took it all in her stride. But what we did notice was a big heaving udder. Yeah, so full of milk. Um, I was just, I was waiting for that cow to drop before um, I made a decision whether I was going to build stanchions or whether we were going to train that cow. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess we want to talk about uh, how we're approaching, what, milking the cow? Yeah, yeah. So before we get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background as to how we um, got Astrid and how she came to be on the property with us. Uh, she is a uh, Jersey cross. There's definitely something else in her I we understand. Angus. We think it might be anger. She's a little bit taller than your standard Jersey. Um, she's got a lovely personality. She actually spent all of her life until she came here as a paddock cow. So not lots of interaction, not the daily interaction that she's been getting here with us. With um, people. She's with got people. plenty of interactions with cows. <laughs> interactions with other cows, but not uh, with people. We've had her for nearly three months now. So we've been making an effort, particularly Troy's been making an effort to um, get that good contact with her and build up her trust. It was all, um, it was all based on bribery. So <laughs> um, when, when I was giving Astrid treats, I would, I would make sure um, you know, that I would always try and contact her in some way. So at first she would toss her head quite a bit and I'd always be trying to you know, just, just gently touch her without alarming her or without annoying her. Um, and then it, it sort of progressed where I was able to rub her shoulder. I just was looking where she would lick and I would, I would scratch there. Um, and then soon I was able to get two hands, I was able to get a bit closer um, and started rubbing her tummy. And as she got more and more pregnant, I started to rub underneath. So mm -hmm. I, I was hoping that she would get um, more comfortable with me sort of... Touching her. Touching down around where we're going to get milk from. Yep. And she had had already, we knew she'd already had a calf with very few issues um, out in the paddock. So that was another reason why we weren't too, we weren't too worried about when she was gonna carve. Uh, we thought that she'd probably do all right this time and thankfully she did. For people that aren't used to cows, a cow's given birth before and a heifer's a virgin bride. Um, so we weren't getting a heifer, we were getting a cow. We knew that she'd already given birth, trouble free. Um, so we were, we were confident. We knew she was pregnant, but we didn't know when she was going to give birth. Yeah, and we, we didn't know. So uh, we got her from um, the Ryans and we did a bit of a special on them. They were raising Jersey steers for meat um, and word got around that we wanted a dairy cow. And it just happened that Dean and Julia um, contacted us and made us an offer we couldn't refuse. But she had got in with the bulls and two things. They didn't know exactly when and they didn't know whether she had contact uh, with a Charolais bull or a Angus? Angus bull, black yeah, Angus. A, a black Angus bull. Mm -hmm. So um, we were waiting and what did it, it looks like? It looks like it's a Charolais. I, it'd be very strange if she was with an Angus. <laughs> yeah, so Charolais is actually a very good outcome for us because that's a utility cow, um, much like a utility chicken. It's not just a milking cow, like for instance, uh, how people think of a Jersey or a Frisian, um, but it's not just a meat cow. Uh, like people think of with an Angus. So um, we think a Charolais is good because a Jersey Charolais, uh, Beatrix, when she grows up, may potentially be uh, another, house good, cow. another good house cow in and of, uh, you know, in her own right. She's very beautiful. She is a baby and Pascal gets clucky easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so Beatrix was born and the day after, um, we just noticed that her udders were just heaving and the calf couldn't keep up with the milk production. 
that Astrid was making. So you decided to have a go. Mm. When Pascal says heaving, milk was actually squirting out of the udders when she out was of the standing, teats, uh, yeah. out of the teats when she was standing still. There was just like a, a thin stream coming out of there. So why don't we just have a look at our first attempt at milking Astrid down where she gave near where she gave birth, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Morning, Astrid. What's that fence? Morning, Astrid. Now I've made this nice and warm. Okay. <laughs> no kicking. Alright. No less kicking than that. So we're going to try and milk Astrid without a milking stall. She's been with us a while and we've been giving her pats and rubs and trying to ingratiate ourselves to her. <laughs> so we'll see if, it's, if it pays off. Probably a little bit harder without a stall, but we want the flexibility of being able to milk her out the paddock or wherever, or bring her under cover if it's raining. So at the moment, I'm going to go with a small pot because she might kick <laughs> and transfer it to a large pot. While we're still just getting um, getting Astrid used to this, I have worn my steel cap boots. <laughs> I don't think she'll kick me, but she might accidentally step on my toes. So I think it's definitely been a benefit um, when Pascal was pregnant, a couple of months of goat milking, because I don't have to I don't have to learn the <laughs> the hand method. Uh, to get the milk out, but having said that, these udders don't allow me to do the pinch one, two, three. It's, they're too little, so I just have to sort of pinch and almost sort of pull down a bit. She's um, she's pretty good. She's really good. Maybe I'll just should, should we just go to the big pot straight? Oh up? no no, just use the little one because you can hold it and squeeze, and then you can just pour it straight into the big. That's how I did it when I started with the goats. It's going to be a, a lot slower. Oh, is it? You want to try and do both at the same time? See, it's like, it's a really small target to aim for. All right, we'll get the bigger pot and have a go. Luckily, I've got a bit of bleach in the wash water. Mm. I wonder if I can take the front udders and leave the back one for the calf. Because they're really awkward to milk. Mm. What do you think? I don't know. I wore the hat because I thought she'd flick me with the tail, but she's not doing it today. You take the hat off and then she'll flick you. Ooh, if I can reach behind her. Whoa, oh, watch out! <gasps> well done. Oh, yeah, Astrid. Good, good reflexes. Yeah. <laughs> she, she actually likes it when I push my head against her belly. Yeah. Like so, what our strategy has been without a stall was to just feed her with something on the other side. On, in this case, it's a, a water tank, but it can be a tree in the future or something like that. Because she won't deliberately hurt me. She will try and shuffle me out the way, but she won't, like, won't do anything too nasty. And she feels kind of reassured if I put my weight against her tummy like this. She really likes it. I remember having a conversation with someone once and they were saying that how horrific it was for cows to be milked. I don't know about a, a big industrial setup, it might be, but on a small scale like this, you can see that with the, the cow has total freedom to go where she wants. Oh, I don't think it's that unpleasant for her. She'd probably rather that I was the calf rather than me. But you know, with, with time, I think she'll just accept that um, we're going to come and take the pressure off her udders. She'll learn. And I don't, I don't think this is, a, this is definitely not a traumatic experience for this cow. It's actually a bit more of a hard experience for me because I'm just trying to get that 
trying to get this pressure, so I'm going to be I'm going to be stuck here in this position for a while. Like this is, there's a lot of milk in here. We've got to get out. <laughs> you can feel it coming, hey? Like as long as you got your head against the. I've got a fair bit. The pressure's starting to come off it now. It's like coming out. Do you think that teat's getting longer because of it? I think we're just gonna have to work on pulling it down. But <laughs> if the calf starts drinking from it, it should get longer too. Yeah. <laughs> she might have been a little bit annoyed because I was behind getting with the camera. Yeah. While you were filming. She might like everyone just within vision, you know? Yeah. She also trusts you more. You're, you feed her. She's, she's, a, she's, she's more your cow than She's a very good judge of character, this cow. <laughs> So you would have noticed in the footage that we weren't uh, milking her with any restraints. Uh, why was that, Troy? I was, um, just as, as our relationship, not mine and Pasky's, but me and the cow, um, as, as that relationship grew, I was starting to get more confident that um, I would be able to milk her and I didn't feel that she would try and kick or anything like that. So what I'm... What, what the idea was then and what I'm trying to maintain now is I, I want to make sure that I don't have to restrain the cow. I, I want to be able to go to her where, wherever she may be um, and milk her in the field. Uh, it, because we're going to be rotating the cow around the place, I want to be able to just go to her with a wheelbarrow with all my milking stuff and some treats. So basically what we want is her to have her head in the wheelbarrow that she recognises as the bringer of good things. Um, and what I have found though is that I do need a barrier on one uh, at her front because she will just go around the wheelbarrow. Yep. Um, and I need a barrier at the side because she will she'll, <laughs> she'll go like that because she, she would rather be left alone to eat, yep. but she will tolerate being me. milked for those treats. For the for the treats. So <laughs> it, it is a struggle. It isn't an easy path. There is a reason why people restrain cows. Um, but, but we want that flexibility. We want that flexibility. We think it's worthwhile. Yeah. So um, I'm, I am open to the idea that one day we might have to build a stall. Okay. But I have other ideas um, about how we can proceed. Yeah. So we wanted Astrid to give birth in that area next to the old house that she was familiar with. Uh, but not long after, we decided to move her off into some pasture because we knew there was a little bit more fodder for her there. Where she was was completely exhausted. Um, so... Yeah, do you want to, we'll take you on that little trip to move her. We hadn't moved her before with her calf, so it was a bit interesting. <laughs> well, the dogs are busy making sure that the shed doesn't have too many uh, rats in it. So they do a really great job actually, along with the cats. But my job this morning is to move the cow. So I've got some of her favorite bribes, apples, um, and we're going to move her into the, the new paddock. Just the other day, um, I noticed in summer, one of the big old original posts from the farm was snapped off at ground level. <laughs> so I did have to go and do a bit of fencing the other day, but now that paddock's ready to receive the cow. There's some nice green grass there that she's gonna hit from a um, bit of a leaky water pipe, uh, but we need to get her there first. She's got a calf. I've moved her without the calf before. We'll see if she follows me with her little baby. De-energise. Makes life so much easier. <laughs> the cow doesn't know for a couple of days of experimentation when you turn it off. Astrid. Good Astrid has infinite respect for any sort of fence. I guess she was already used to electric fence when she came. And so we can, um, we, we can guide her with buckets, but if she's a bit recalcitrant, you can get by and you can push her sort of along a fence and I know that she won't go through it. She won't go under it or anything like that. So we were very easy, uh, it was very easy just to sort of 
guide her down. She followed the bucket, but of course the calf wanted to stay where uh, she'd been born. So Beatrix, Beatrix was the sort of <laughs> the X factor on that one. Yeah. Um, but we found that we were able to, um, by using treats, sort of get Astrid to one point, leave some treats to keep her sort of pinned to that um, that point, and then go down and just gently, gently put uh, pressure on Beatrix. Yep. I thought that was going to be successful, <laughs> but it wasn't. And in the end, I actually had to um, pick Beatrix up and bring her to her mum. And then I think um, and we, we, we were fairly successful then of just gradually just sort of moving them yep. as a unit, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. So we got there in the end. There's amazing grass up here, Astrid. Come on. Further up there is fire break, but I've left this sort of standing and we haven't had any big rains yet. There's not going to be much in this, but we did seed this with some chicory and some plantain, which Astra's finding, and there's some other other weeds growing growing here. There's a bit of, a bit of water leakage from a pipe just up there where there's some nice green grass. But the rest of this, it's not amazing feed, but hopefully it'll get, a, get our cow through the hungry gap without us having to buy much more hay because <laughs> This is hay, it just happens to be standing there, but yeah, everything's gone to seed. There's not much in it, she's not gonna be that thrilled. Luckily we've got that brewery grain for her. I've turned this fence off just so Astra can get in here. I've heard some people say that you always leave your electric fence energized no matter what because it'll kill off the grass as it grows into it. <laughs> It does, but it doesn't stop the grass from, from growing all around it. And she's been dying for a bit of green stuff, get that chlorophyll. We've just been feeding her dry hay, brewery grain and apples, but this is what we really want for the cream. Um, I'll be also getting her some leguminous trees that we've got locally that make fodder. When this is all gone, we'll get her some green stuff like that and hopefully improve the flavor of our milk, even though it's, it's already pretty amazing. So we got there in the end, uh, she really enjoyed that grass, it didn't last long and even those bits of green pasture mix that were in that paddock there, long gone. Uh, but she's still enjoying her brewery grain and apples and you've been milking her up next to the washing line. Mm. And so how's that been going since that first time that we milked her? It's been pretty good. Um, what, I, what I do want to, oh what's up there cat? What I do want to um, just say about that pasture is we were, we've been shepherding that through the summer. Um, we sort of had an idea with our early summer that hay was going to be an issue. We did get some hay rolls. So I've actually um, left quite a bit of standing feed there. There's not much in it. So Astrid has, um, you know, she's been nibbling at it, but she hasn't been that excited and she knows that the brewery grain is coming. <laughs> so um, she still remembers that wheelbarrow and what we've been doing is we have um, an electric fence guarding our clothesline <laughs> from the rest of the paddock um, and it does form a corner and i'm able to lure her around um, and put the put the wheelbarrow up against the corner there's another electric fence here and she can't go that way i didn't do that when i first um, when i first got the cow in she came in and i put the wheelbarrow sort of in the middle <laughs> and she was able to uh, you know, there was hijinks. She, she was quite happy to flick me Walk out the around. way. Um, she does want to, she, she's got an instinct to save that for her calf. She doesn't have an instinct, um, you know, for feeding humans. Yeah, she's fair enough. <laughs> but I don't think she thinks it through that much. The, the very first day was very straightforward. It was the second day that was, um, she was really like, um, she gets moods. She's, the cows, mm. cows get moody. So she didn't want to um, share or she, I don't think it's share, she just didn't, she didn't feel like having me uh, mucking around there while she was having her treats. 
I actually took the treats away at one stage, just like training a dog. Um, so that's, I guess, negative reinforcement for those people that are into their animal training. I just took it away and she sort of looked at me um, and I took it away for some time. And when I brought it back, she got the idea and then I was able to milk her. But it wasn't until I actually put the wheelbarrow in a corner where she was sort of restrained, where we, we actually got our first four, four liters in one hit. So today, I, I, we, our fridge was filling up, <laughs> and the cows, but the calf, sorry, Beatrix has been, um, she's been drinking really well through the night and in the morning. So I actually stopped at about three liters today. But usually, what'll happen is I'll get to four liters. It's remarkable how how I get to four liters, and then Astrid just sort of shuffles her feet, and she sort of just, she gets a, a leg in the way. Whereas normally she'll come up and she'll stand in a way that I can actually reach everything. Um, and when she's, when she's had enough, she actually moves a leg. Yeah. And if I don't take the hint, she'll, she'll actually start just, just gently pushing away from the wheelbarrow. So um, I've just been working with her on that. And I've just been taking it away and it's four litres. <laughs> she's like, there's your four litres. Yeah, right. Um, and when she, when she says enough, I haven't been taking the grain. I've been like, as a thank you, I've just quietly taken the four litres of milk and I've left her um, with that grain because as the calf grows, um, she, she should make more. Um, and we'll work with restraining the calf later to try and get some more. But at the moment, I'm very, very happy to take that four litres because um, we haven't really worked out a strategy to deal with um, you know, that much milk coming in all the time. Yep. Like if, it, if it exceeds four litres, we're gonna, we're gonna have to do something. So the four litres is not, I've noticed there's not a high cream content on there yet because we're not really stripping her out. We're just taking the excess milk from the back udders we've noticed mainly because yep. the calf has been uh, favouring the front teats. Yep. And um, yeah, so how have you been? You've just been milking the rear teats basically? Yeah, well, I, I, I try and focus on the rear teats, but we did have um, one of our lovely commenters, we, so many of you, <laughs> um, I don't remember who precisely it was, and they recommended milking on the diagonal, a back teat and a front teat diagonally across from the other, um, to stop the cow kicking. Maybe our cow's gentle, um, but I'm just going to assume that that comment was right. So I have been um, going diagonal. And that's working? It seems to be, and then other times I can just get both of those teats yeah. um, and really make some good progress. Yeah. So when you say not much cream, um, if there's some cow people out there, we've got a jersey and in a one litre jar, there's probably about an inch and a half of cream at the top. Yeah. So I don't know if it should be one third cream or, or whatever, but bear yeah. in mind that Astrid is actually like, okay, that's it. And I, I am not, I'm, not, I'm not stripping out the last of the milk. Yeah. And it's our understanding that the last of the milk is where the, the kind milk is where all the cream is. So Yeah, if, you've, yeah. if anyone out there has got other information, we'd love to hear from you. And if anyone out there is just like, that's a recipe for mastitis, we're aware of the danger of leaving it. But there is a calf out there that, <laughs> that goes um, straight on and works those nipples. So we think maybe yeah. the calf is helping us avoid any of those issues. But yeah. cer certainly the teats have never came up inflamed and they look fairly clean to me each morning when I when I wash them in preparation for milking. Yeah, exactly. And she has gone through a whole calving season with a calf and not had mastitis. So even though she's a dairy breed and she wasn't milked out. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was reassuring. Yeah, yeah. so I think things are going really well. Um, again, it's early days, but Astrid um, has, has been fairly accepting. I got away from the electric wire today for a bit of an ex experiment and I I actually pushed her up against a, a bush <laughs> um, and she found that she could sort of manoeuvre a bit, but she's getting used to the routine. She let me milk out, um, a, a but like I said, I didn't take the full um, load today because she was a little bit jittery. There was a change, like cows are creatures of habit. Yeah, and we've also noticed that if the calf is really active and running around, then she doesn't want to be milked. She's mm. actually just walked away. The, yeah, and the calf does definitely have joie de vie. <laughs> the, the dogs were an issue at first, as was a crying baby. Um, and we found, well, we locked up the dogs a couple of times and now they just lay in the sun and wait. So that's good. Um, the crying baby was just a one-off. She's a generally a fairly happy, happy little thing. Um, 
There was a problem that we wanted to nip in the bud paskin, and that was if we were always bringing the cow to the one spot next to the washing line, to come winter, that would have just been a real pugged up, muddy mess yes. right next to the house, right next to the washing uh, line. Yep. So I don't think Pascal would have enjoyed that. So now um, I am like moving the cow around. And I think in future what I'll do is I'll make temporary stalls. She's scared of the white poly wire. Yep. Um, so what I might actually do is just make a little rectangle. She doesn't know, no, it's not electrified. I might just make a rectangular stall just in different spots and just bring her to that. Yeah. Um, because I know when it gets wet, uh, at the moment dust is an issue, but when it gets wet, we do have pugging and mud as an issue. Yeah. I think I will sort of work out an undercover area because the last thing I want to do is sit in the rain, having yep. rain coming off me into the milk, coming down the cow, dripping into the milk. Um, and sitting in mud. So something we'll have to get worked out, but I'm enjoying this uh, cow training. And what do you think of the milk? I think it's great. It's, um, uh, we're the, at the moment, the cow's got a high percentage of apples and brewery grain in her diet, and maybe that's contributing to it, but it's very, very sweet. Yep. Um, oh, I, I prefer it more than goat milk. Yep. Uh, I've never really liked goat milk. It's just that our goats have made particularly sweet milk. And um, it's not that I tolerated, I thought it was really nice, but this, Jersey milk, uh, it's really good. It's like it's like ice cream, but just a bit less sugar. <laughs> yeah, and by all accounts, uh, when she's on pasture, hopefully this spring or later on in the season, later in autumn, um, we're going to get a little bit more of that cream as well, is what I've heard. I think chlorophyll will be a big one. So the first flush of grass um, will be a bit watery and yep. her gut bacteria won't be used to it. So she might have some runny poo. So We actually noticed that when she ate all that green grass in one day. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So um, again, maybe it, was, maybe it was Brian over there in New Zealand, um, if I remember correctly. When it, that autumn runny poo season, I will definitely be washing the cow's tail. Yes. <laughs> because um, it's quite frequent that I do get a slap up the side of the head with a cow tail. And I can't even imagine what <laughs> that must be like. With scour. <laughs> with, with runny cow poo up the side of my head. Yeah. I guess that pretty much wraps up our milking journey at present. Uh, we just wanted to share with you the wonderful news of Beatrix being born and our first attempts at milking Astrid. Uh, if you guys have any helpful information or tips, if you've had experience with dairy cows in the past, we'd be really grateful if you could hit us up in the comment section. Mm, I'll, I'll definitely second that. We, we are always super appreciative of the great comments that we always get, but this is a real cry out there for, <laughs> um, for assistance. If you have um, experience with cows and particularly the way that we're trying to do it, um, you know, a comment might not be so helpful if it's just like, hey, you idiot, just build a stall. Um, <laughs> We might, we might end up doing that, but uh, if you've built up a relationship with a, with a cow and you can just milk her in the field, we'd love to, we'd love to hear um, your recommendations. It seems to be working. It seems to be going that way. Um, so yeah, any comments like that would be, would be really welcome. Um, but other than that, just thank you to everyone that supports us in your usual fashion. Yep. Um, it's always appreciated and we just couldn't do it without you guys. Do-do-do-do. Mm -hmm.